So what we're going to do is we're here to expose it, let people tell their story, and let them, let everybody in the public see the horrors of the court system in Suffolk County, New York. Jacobs of Long Island Backstory. Today is August 11th, 2015, and we're standing out in front of the New York County Lawyers Association building where they're doing uh, supposed hearings on attorney discipline. Uh, we've already asked to be, uh, to be inside and to film it, and we were denied the request. In fact, when we just went into the building, a woman came out and said we're not even permitted to film in front of her building, and we told her to go ahead and call the police. So. I don't know what it is that they don't want to. They don't want us to see, but they're certainly hiding something in this place. Uh, today, these fake, what they're calling hearings, were supposedly because there's such a pervasive problem in New York State with uh, the Attorney Review Board, and of course, it's a self-regulating agency where the attorneys in their own committee, in their own county, review one another. Well, of course, that's a problem, and justice is uh, administered on family. There is no appeals process if you get denied. But of course, for the attorneys involved, if they get sanctioned, there is an appeal process. Uh, especially on Long Island, cases just summarily dismissed where there's black and white evidence of what could happen. So what's the solution of the lawyers? Is they're gonna appoint a committee of another bunch of lawyers to determine whether or not the lawyers are capable of making their decision. They did a big press release a couple weeks ago where they announced this commission. They appointed about 40 people, all lawyers, so that now on their resume, they can say that they were part of this attorney uh, review board. So it looks good on their resume. Of course, most of them aren't going to be here today. And most of them didn't show up at the last hearing. A public hearing is supposed to be for the public to come and testify. What they did was they didn't publicize how you were supposed to testify. So what they did was they put on their website that you had to submit your written testimony 14 days prior and then they would decide whether or not you can testify. Of course, anybody who put in something that they didn't want to hear was never called back or was called back and told they couldn't testify. When I spoke to John Cahill, he told me that they ended up doing it on a first come, first serve basis. But Elena Sassauer and Carl Lance's error were one of the people on the first day that put it in. And of course, they said they couldn't speak. Uh, they couldn't I'm speak speaking. either. Oh, you are speaking? Okay, we have Elena Sassauer yes. here who says that she will, be, uh, she will be speaking, but Carl won't. So what we're going to do is film the people who were not able to testify today and let them get their word out, and we will send a copy of this show out to everybody. But, but everyone should know that even if they're not here testifying, there are opportunities to present your information and your evidence. What you need to do is uh, contact me, Elena Sassauer, 914-421-1200, judgewatch.org, and um, I will get that information to the commission to be sure that they are evaluating it. What we most need are copies of the attorney disciplinary complaints that you filed that were thrown out without investigation or maybe with investigation but insufficient investigation. We need to have the hard evidence, the complaints you filed and the dismissal letters. Thanks for the job you're doing here today. <laughs> and thanks, Lena. So we're getting close to getting into the hearing. We're going to wait here for a few minutes, see if they do call the police, because we do have a right to be here on a public sidewalk. If not, we're going to go in, we're going to listen to the hearings that we're not allowed to record at, and then we're going to film after the hearings start. Here with Suzanne McCormick. She was one of the people who had uh, an excellent argument and should at least been able to speak in front of the committee. But uh, so far, we're halfway through the committee, and everybody but one person was an attorney. So it's interesting that this is a uh, hearing about attorney misconduct, yet who do they have speak? The attorney. So I'm going to let Suzanne, she's going to say what she wanted to say if she was in front of the hearing. Here you go, Suzanne. Okay, uh, this is in regard to an estate of my husband's, and it was around uh, close to a $50 million estate. I never got my full marital deduction. I didn't get hardly any inheritance. Um, it, Thank you, Judge. It involves Bankers Trust Company, who was supposed to be the lead executor, and they weren't on the letters testamentary. We found that out. 
they had the wrong name, so it, actually they had no legal authority. It involves Wynne Rutherford of White and Case, who drafted the will. They came to our home many times, went over the will with us, and basically tossed it. They didn't go by the will at all. Uh, there was a lot of real estate and our collection and so forth. Bankers Trust Company is a convicted federal felon in the Southern District of New York in 1999, and they are barred as such from being a fiduciary in the state of New York. Uh, it, it is just, uh, White and Case also abandoned the estate approximately two months after the inception of the estate. Uh, they've gone to, gone, gotten a certificate of relief from the state of New York. How can the state of New York absolve a federal crime? Three, three counts, three fe federal felonies. In addition to that, there was a defalcation, uh, an embezzlement of 300 and some odd thousand dollars, and uh, nobody knows anything. They got a bookkeeper, and that was the end of it, you know. There were many other things. The lawyers don't want to address the, the fraud on the court. When the letters were issued, the letters of testamentary were issued, they don't want to address it because the bank and the law firms, the white shoe law firms, they want to cover it all up. It's been 27 years I've been at this. We protested. I've had a lot of publicity. Um, what else we've can picketed, I say? We've, we've, picketed, uh, we've engaged in educational picketing in the city of New York and in Florida, in Palm Beach, Florida. And all they do is hunker down and, and uh, they, don't, they don't do anything. The general counsel for Deutsche Bank, Troll and Link, wanted to speak to us and get into a, a, a good faith settlement discussion. And, and the law firm of White and Case and Pillsbury Winthrop. Uh, sabotaged at all. And I can also say in regard to judges, there's one judge with legal fees that I did not owe. My lawyer said actually I overpaid. I was due a hundred thousand back and in the back chambers with the judge he said have her bring a hundred and twenty five thousand uh, bank check to me and uh, we'll just put it behind us. My lawyers talked me into it. I brought it. Then he said to the lawyers in the back room, do you think we can get 50,000 more out of her? So then, actually, what happened is this judge cost me in the end $600,000. So this is what goes on with judges. And where do they put that money? Who gets it? Actually, the law firm that was suing me, they went bankrupt. And so, in addition to that, you have a situation, the old saying is war is too important to be left to the generals. Well, law and the oversight of the law profession is too important to be left to the lawyers. It should be an independent body that has supervisory authority over all of them. My name is Linda Gilbo, Dr. Linda Gilbo. I'm here to hear the hearing. Attorney Alton Maddox is here also to speak. This is a very important issue. We are very dissatisfied with the malpractice and the disruptive things that are happening in the judicial system. He was actually given, uh, he was, dis he was a re uh, not allowed to uh, work in the criminal justice system. It was supposed to be uh, for a few years and it has amounted to 25 years. We need qualified attorneys that know how to represent the people. We are very dissatisfied with the criminal injustice system. And I am so happy that they're having this hearing. This hearing should have been done years ago. The judges, prosecutorial misconduct, uh, withholding information. It is outrageous. With the state of the community, with all this uh, P police brutality, mass incarceration. We this 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 um, hearing is far beyond, uh, far past done, and we want the uh, officials, the senators. We want the legislators, the city council. They should all be here because you need to represent the people. Our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren are being locked up. They're being criminalized. There's a there's a a. a, a a, a straight line from the schoolhouse to the 
to the to the uh, penitentiary, and we are sick and tired of it. We're standing here today, and we're demanding that these legislators who are sitting back on their laurels, getting money, all of them are being fined for they're under they're, uh, they're indicted, they're they're being uh, looked at. It's all for financial gain, nothing for the community. Enough is enough. We are tired of this and we want justice. Justice now. No justice, no peace. It re, uh, reinstate attorney Alton Maddox. We need a good black attorney who has never lost a case in the black community. All these attorneys come, come into the courtroom. When he comes to the courtroom, they come and watch because he's magnificent. We need him to be reinstated because they do not know how to represent the black people in the black community. We need representation now. Please hear our plea. Thank you. My name is Amy Gurvey, G-U-R-V-E-Y. I am, um, I went to UCLA Law School. I have my Master's of Law from Harvard, and I uh, have my Master's in Biotechnology. I'm a patent inventor and started a technology firm. Last year, the U.S. Supreme Court decided Gunn versus Minton, G-U-N-N versus Minton, 133 S. Court 1059, U.S. Supreme Court, Texas, from Justice Roberts, holding that the state has primary responsibility to discipline and adjudicate matters of patent attorney malpractice and breach of fiduciary duty. And New York State has taken no measures compliant with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision. I gave my U.S. patent attorneys $50,000. They stole it and put my inventions in other clients' patent applications and purged the files. I went to the disciplinary committee over five years. They did absolutely nothing to help me. And since you're from Long Island, there's a similar case, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories versus Ropes and Gray that was transferred from the Eastern District of New York to the District of Massachusetts because the Second Department Disciplinary Committee wouldn't prosecute the lawyers either. The state of Massachusetts did, and that's where that case is being adjudicated. I, however, was, in, in 2008, I got a petition from the Disciplinary Committee. Not, I'm not even admitted here. I'm on retired status in California in, in retaliation for my filing a complaint against a major New York law firm. There is no jurisdiction over me. They didn't order my patent files back. They didn't order my $50,000 retainer back. And separate and apart from all of this, last year I got a notice from the USPTO General Counsel that the New York law firm is under criminal investigation for potentially criminal misconduct and stealing my patents. New York State has done absolutely nothing to help me, and now New York State and New York City are using my patented inventions. So I've got the quintessential case. If you want to cover my case against the disciplinary committee, it is currently before Judge Wooten in Part 7. The case number is 163. 2015 filed in January of 2015 and the case is currently being adjudicated against the disciplinary committee for violating my right to equal protection of the law that protects consumers against bad lawyers. The lawyers who did not who ignored my grievances at the disciplinary committee and were state employees and chief counsels over the course of several years then left the state's employee and without disclosing their own conflicts of interest took up the same lawyer's defense when I had to sue them in the Southern District of New York. That and, and those lawyers are in there now and I've actually sued them in the state case. As I'm, I'm here, I'm proud to be here with the founder of Americans for Legal Reform, Carl Lance era and it's uh, I think it's interesting we're, we're right here in front of uh, ground zero where we had an attack on our uh, on our country 
right now there's an attack on the general public by the legal system and Carl Lance's era has been fighting this for many years. He did put in testimony and asked to speak today, but like so many of us was told that he will not be heard today in court. So we're gonna let him speak out today for the camera and we'll report his story. Th thank you very much, Gary. You're doing a great job. We need young blood like you. Old farts like us have been doing it for 30 years. 25 years ago, I attended the Craco Commission. Same subject, lawyer discipline. What was done? Nothing. In 1992, Newsday printed in the paper, lawyer, when lawyers steal, 40% of the state's complaints are on Long Island, from Long Island. And all we get is two hours here in New York City. Uh, there's been the Craco commissions, the, the uh, Samson hearings. Where are the Samson hearings? Lawyers, judges, and retired court personnel testified how corrupt the system is. They like it that way. The foxes are running the chicken coop, are taking charge of the chicken coop. We have to stop this. The only way to stop it is if there were 5,000 people here. As long as we have these lawyers testifying, it ain't broken, don't fix it, it's gonna continue. It's up to you, the public, to stop it or see your country fall apart. Ray Rogers, Director of Corporate Campaign, Inc. Uh, I'd like to talk about a prominent attorney who's been on 60 Minutes twice. He's operating in New York as we speak in a case. Uh, he's being sued for racketeering, legal malpractice, fraud, and unjust enrichment. His name is Willie Gary, very prominent attorney out of Stewart, Florida, operating Cohack Vice in New York on another major case. We we believe that he's involved also in racketeering fraud, uh, legal malpractice and racketeering in that. Um, it's amazing how these attorneys like Willie Gary can operate and steal millions of dollars and not be held accountable by either the Bar Association in Florida or the Bar Associations in places like New York and New York State. Um, Mr. Gary is, is involved in a lawsuit right now, Roe Entertainment et al. versus Gary et al. Uh, he is also, which relates to a situation involving a big racial discrimination lawsuit against the William Morris Agency. Now, Mr. Gary was involved in a lawsuit with Ford Motor Company representing 42 women. It was found that he had uh, settled for 51 and a half million. The woman never knew it. He then had another settlement for 16 million for these women. He took 6 million of that for special programs. He then took the 10 million to distribute amongst the 42 women, of which he took one third of that plus expenses. This is the kind of stuff that he's been involved in, and we hope to put a stop to it. People should go to the clientkiller.org website. The clientkiller.org website, and you'll see how attorneys like Willie Gary. He, his law firm, and five other former and present partners, including former mayor of Atlanta, uh, Bill Campbell, are being sued again for racketeering, fraud, legal malpractice, and unjust enrichment. Go to the clientkiller.org website. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Yvette Stark, and I came here to observe the Judicial Committee. And I'm not an attorney, and uh, unfortunately, I'm married to an attorney and involved in a divorce for now close to six years. Uh, there has been major corruption, collusion, uh, and criminal activity. And uh, I believe that net worth statements are looked at and money is used and spent by the judge and approved by the judge with escrow accounts. And it doesn't necessarily have to be with stealing of escrow. It can be with another friend in collusion who's another attorney yeah. actually paying taxes perhaps for a spouse's business and not applying the tax payments that are necessary to um, our personal accounts, thereby causing enormous liens so that a less moneyed spouse has no money, has no bank account, and is pressured. There, the, act, the, the, the lack of discovery time, this is six years that I'm going on this divorce, the lack of discovery is unconscionable. Uh, my husband is a personal injury attorney, and
and he actually, all of his cases can be found on e-tracking and e-files, and the first attorney who represented me, who I did fire for cause, and does have a lien on me for over $28,000, and if it includes uh, interest, it could be higher. Um, it's just unconscionable that for like three years I was being dragged along because discovery was not being provided by my husband, another attorney, yet also working with another attorney. And the judge allowed this to happen. The judge knows there's e-tracking and e-files. My previous attorney, who I fired for cause, knew there was e-tracking and e-files. And nobody disclosed this. Instead, we had to bill and bill a bill for support checks, bill for dental. I still have no teeth and I'm really in bad shape medically. Because, bill, because bills for medical have not been paid for years and years. The less money spouse is totally prosecuted and persecuted, and it's diabolical and unconscionable, and grown children's inheritances are suffering. I have actually asked my new attorney, what do I need to do? Do I need to uh, commit suicide or commit homicide? That was the last note I wrote two days ago. So I think that there's more at stake here for pushing and pushing and pushing and taking away money from the less moneyed spouse with these escrow accounts and paying salaries and perpetuating the payment of salaries to friends or attorneys. There's more here than that. There is suicide that takes place. There is mental abuse. There is physical abuse. There is emotional abuse. There are children suffering here. Whether they're young children or older children, the system needs to be reformed and uh, these are attorneys need to be investigated, prosecuted, and frankly go to jail. And the judges need to be removed from the bench, and their pensions need to be rescinded as well. Thank you. We have with us famed civil rights attorney Alton Maddox, who surprisingly, they let speak, uh, and they let testify today. Most of the attorneys that they let testify, no surprise, we're here to show their support and show how wonderful the system is and how we have to protect these attorneys because so many complaints are thrown out. Alton Maddox, I will say, besides give, giving a very passionate uh, speech, he didn't take any of that crap, he didn't let them bully him, and he put them on the spot, which is, of course, what they don't like about attorneys. These are the people, they're not part of the uh, in crowd who just play by the rules. So I'm going to let uh, Alton Maddox say something here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, we had a great day today. I think the real story here was that the problem that affect our community, affect other communities as well. Uh, because we've been discussing some of these issues as they affected us, and we ran uh, ads in the uh, New York Amsterdam News, we ran ads in our town press about apartheid justice. But then when we got here, I don't care who they were, how they looked, they were all saying the same thing. So we have a serious problem in New York, you know, and it has to be addressed. And one of the things that I've called for, and I think is necessary, is that we're back at a stage as we were in 1955 with the Montgomery bus boycott. And at that particular time, people recognized that the only way that we were gonna get any sense of dignity uh, was to boycott. We're not talking about dignity now, we're talking about justice, uh, which is something more substantial. And so if we are allowing ourselves to be treated the way that we are being treated, and being treated because in 1991, a Blue Ribbon Commission, the New York Commission on Judicial Minorities, found that New York judicial system was infested with racism. And, and since that particular time, everybody's been afraid to say it. And that one thing we got over today was that we not only have to deal with the question of attorney discipline, but we also have to deal with judicial racism. And that is what is killing us. It was judicial racism that brought about the Scottsboro Boys case. It was judicial racism that brought the Central Park 7 case. Now we see judicial racism raising its ugly head in Richmond County with Eric Garner, with Sean Bell in Queens, with Christopher Ridley uh, in Westchester, with John White uh, in Suffolk County. So they're all over the place, but it's very systematic. It's very systematic. And uh, it's something that we cannot let go under the rug. Uh, and that uh, this is not the end of the struggle, this is the beginning. You, you mentioned uh, racism towards African Americans, mm -hmm. and, and that's, you have a lot of supporters here. Right. But like you said, I think this transcends the line. I think mm -hmm. it's more of a fact 
that there's just an overall bias. I, from right. my standpoint, right. there's a bias against fathers right. when mm -hmm. they go to court. When it comes to custody mm -hmm. battles, right. you know, fathers are trying to turn them into right. uh, ATMs. Right. As you said, African American. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're an African American man, right. you got two strikes right. against Absolutely. you. You don't right. have a shot in hell going up right. against Nobody. these elite right. lawyers, right. especially in Suffolk right. County and where I'm places. familiar. Right. And, and 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 that's the problem. And I, that's what I think that we began to realize is that this problem has to be seriously examined and has to be seriously examined by people in so many other communities. And I think the first thing we have to do is to extract this transcript and look at this testimony and then begin to combine those witnesses into a very powerful force. But right now, The Economist magazine in June, front page uh, cover was the Jailhouse Nation. And it was talking about over two million blacks behind bars. That's a very dismal situation. And it does not allow for the future of families, nor does it allow for the future of the children where you have over two million black men now behind bars. Now, Mr. Matt, one of the things you asked for, and uh, we've been trying to fight this, uh, I'm with Americans for legal reform, for years we get nowhere. What they do is they silence people like you who fight right. out against the right. system, right. and they just turn, you know, he's a crazy guy, Let, let's right. get rid of him. Right. You called for a boycott right. against the judicial system. Absolutely. Let me ask you, what, what do you mean by a boycott? What do you do when they, when they pull you into the system? What do you do? You'll end up in jail. Well, what, what you do is this, uh, and we did the same thing uh, with Tawana Brawley, and that was a precedent and has to be followed. Uh, the only way that you can fight this system is to, obviously, when you uh, have to submit because you've been forced uh, to appear in court, but if there's an opportunity to get bail, once you get bail, don't come back. And that, that, that's how you deal with it. And instead of coming back, you go to a church because all the church's doors are supposed to be open. And so you go into a church and then you call the clerk of the court and tell them that's where you are. And so if they want you, come and get you. And uh, I think that uh, there's not enough vehicles uh, in this city to start going around transporting people uh, from these various churches. And so that, that's the point that we have to make. That was the point that we made into Warner Brothers. I mean, people said, well, you can't put it in a sanctuary. We did. And nobody came. And uh, to Warner left, her mother left, and now they're down in Virginia. So it's no, it's no question that we can fight back. And it's just a question of everybody recognizing that in order to save souls, you have to save bodies. And uh, when preachers are concerned about, on Sundays, talking about their sermons, we have to really let them know that black lives do matter. And it didn't just start. Black lives have mattered ever since we've been here. Uh, again, thank you for showing up today. I know you have no skin in the game, but uh, the fact that you're out there fighting for people who can't and being a voice for them, for all of us, not just the African-American community, but everybody, as you said, has just been beaten down by this corrupt and this sham of a committee that right. they had here. And right. you pointed it out, right. Right. and you right. called them on their right. shit, right. and I really appreciate right. that. Right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming.